So I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, the pleasure of having my, my good colleague Jeffrey here and, and the fact that he organized this exhibition was a lovely sort of opportunity for me when I jo first joined over at the Contemporary Arts Center. For those of you who have been there uh, and seen this exhibition, we, you, you know what's coming. And for those of you who haven't, uh, the exhibition that features the artists who we're going to be speaking tonight runs until December 9th. But the opportunity for the contemporary, which of course deals with contemporary art, deals with it in a variety of, of forms, it was a great opportunity to know that the Morris Lewis show was coming because I'm interested in painting, I'm interested in painting's legacy. And the places in the city right now, I think, where you could actually see the impact of an artist like Morris Lewis are few and far between. I mean, you could certainly go upstairs at the museum and see the permanent collection and see some of the art by somebody like Gerhard Richter and Jonathan Lasker and other artists whose works come out of some of the methodologies of mid-century painting. But it seemed like a great opportunity to be able to pull a show together that would examine ways in which artists, contemporary artists, have been influenced by the issues that Morris Lewis's work raises. How do you make a painting? Not necessarily the question of how do you paint one, but how do you make one? What's the process? What's the scale? How is that a performative act? What's the time sequence? Where do you do this? Um, and I was pretty sure that what I wanted to do was put together a show that looked at these issues in painting, but didn't necessarily include any painters in it because I'm arguing with this show that the exhibition uh, hopefully makes a, makes a point of saying that part of the legacy of Morris Lewis is that his activities and the issues around abstraction are empowering mediums like photography and video and sculpture and drawing through ideas that, that make sense from mid-century making practices. So the show is very calculated to not include painting, but would be about painting and would try to include a variety of nationally based artists, Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles and Boston, working in a variety of ways and methods and that you're gonna get a little sample of tonight. So um, I wanna talk a little less now and maybe a little bit more later, I wanna introduce Carl Erickson, who's joined us from Los Angeles. He'll tell you about his work. This will be as brief as the sort of tour Jeffrey gave and then Sarah Brayman and, and Phil Grauer from New York will talk about what they do, and then we'll have a little conversation about this legacy and what does it mean and where does it wind up. So without further ado, Carl Erickson. Thanks to Stuart and Jeffrey and everybody at the High and the Contemporary for having us out. I got to see the show today and it's great. Um, as Stuart said, my name is Carl Erickson. I'm from Los Angeles uh, and I just wanted to show you some of my art tonight. I, uh, I probably overloaded my little CD PowerPoint thing with, with pictures, so I'll go fast and if anybody wants me to slow down, I will. Uh, that's supposed to come on when I said hi. It's just my. So, hello. Um, it, this past summer, I've been asked to be in two shows at talked about my influences in art, which I thought was a really interesting opportunity. And one was about uh, Sun Ra, and the other was about Morris Lewis, which we all just saw. Um, and I, it was just a weird position to be put in to, to be able to focus really intently on uh, what, what inspired you or drives you to make the kind of things you do. I don't know if anybody here knows much about Sun Ra, but he was a jazz musician, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. He finally died in the early 90s, but he claimed he was from Saturn um, his basic tenet was that he, as a, a black man living in the, the segregated South, that he, he was not a human being, so he had to be from outer space. And kind of that, that philosophy, this philosophy of trying to, to reach outside of our present human condition, um, influenced all of his music and kind of his lifestyle choice. Uh, I just found him to be really kind of inspiring and motivating. Um, and you'll see his face pop up quite a few times through what I'm about to show you. Um, while I was getting ready for this talk, I started to think about what it is that um, connected both Morris Lewis or color field painting, though uh, Jeffrey told us not to use color field. Um, I didn't know. Um, and, and Sun Ra. So you can see I just have, oops, too far. Um, I have a laser pointer, which is nice of him to give me. Um, 
So we have Killer Filthy and Amy Sunra over here. And I just kind of give uh, all the uh, little things that connect the two of them. But to me, what, once I started thinking about it, the thing that connected them both was the, this idea of um, transcending the individual or kind of losing the sense of ego, which like, connected really nicely to a lot of the other work I've been doing that um, works upon the uh, history of psychedelic art and kind of psychedelic counterculture. Um, yeah. So this is one of the rugs I have in the show. I, I make, or some of the things I make, I'm kind of all over the place. Um, well, I took rugs, which uh, a lot of you might know from your grandmothers or the little kids who get these little Lion King or unicorn kind of sets, and you can hook a little rug. I make them based on psychedelic light shows, mostly um, light shows that my friend Robbie Herbst and I make. Um, we do it old school kind of way. We have overhead projectors and glass bowls that we pour in water and colored dyes and oils and heat them up and watch the, the blobs move around. Um, that practice itself is very, uh, um, it's very time-based. Every action you do causes a big splash on the screen, and then it's gone. What I do with the rugs is I, I take one, one still from the, a video I would take of it, and then I laboriously, over the course of three or four months on this one this size, um, make it into these rugs. And it, it kind of, it does the opposite thing for me that the, the light shows do, which are so fast and so, uh, so transitory. They use, you, you lose yourself in the exact opposite way because you're, you're kind of left um, dealing with this one moment of time. It's all mechanical. There's no more decision making to be made. And you're working on it. So it's another example kind of, of ego loss. Uh, this is the other rug that's in the show. Uh, this one was not inspired by a light show that my friend Robbie and I did, but rather a light show by the, the Boyle family, which is a psychedelic, or were a psychedelic light show outfit in the 1960s, kind of swinging London. Uh, this was from a show with a band called Soft Machine. Uh, how I kind of got to this area of what I was doing. Uh, kind of started with this video called Flapping Your Arms Can Be Flying. Um, and in it, it, it takes its name from a psychedelic poster from the 60s that I called Flapping Your Arms Can Be Flying, which I thought kind of encapsulated the whole spirit of, of kind of the hippies, the, the kind of mythological counterculture, and their... Uh, both the, the joyous part with them and the problems with them, and that you know they had all this wonderful energy, kind of creative force, but they didn't really put it to much use. So like the idea of running around pretending that you're flying was one of the, the best and worst things that they could do. So this video, you, you just have this young man running around. I picked this guy. He's my friend Tom, but he's really active in um, political organization and these unions in Los Angeles. He's a great guy, and he's kind of like all the good spots of the spirits of the of the '60s. And, and none of the bad. So uh, at the same time as making these videos, I've been making these psychedelic posters. Um, some of you can probably read that. because I used to be a vegetarian. Um, what I liked about the posters is kind of the same thing as the rugs, is that except they work on the viewer in this way. They really slow you down. And it takes a while to read them. Um, another one of my influences keeps popping up. You can see Allen Ginsberg right there. Um, this one says, uh, would the world be better without me? Um, that's that cat you might recognize from self-help posters. Um, you know, hang in there. Or uh, sometimes it says, oh shit, which is kind of my preferred one. Um, it says, or I, I just read it because I don't want to come down again. Uh, what do we got? And this one, just kind of my justification for, for liking basketball. is that, That's kind of been the biggest seller, too. So I think there are a lot of, I, I don't know if they're closet basketball fans, but there you go. Um, this, this is the, the first image I used for Sun Ra um, in this kind of psychedelic style. Yeah, it was just back during the 2004 election, uh, all these artists were kind of being asked to, to give artwork because we didn't have any money to support Kerry, but I didn't really like Kerry. I know I didn't like George Bush. So I was like, I'll do it because I should, but um, I wanted to let it be known that I wanted somebody else. And this, this is just an installation view of... Uh, how I display the posters. Kind of has that similar uh, overload, kind of visual overload that the light shows have. You see a few of them. In this show, I had this video. Um, this video basically had three characters that are all trying to defeat gravity, which is like a, another mass center of our attention, kind of like our egos. Um, so I'll just I'll flip quickly through these. Um, in it, the first character is kind of this wizard who does, uses all these cinematic effects to 
to, to break free. And this one, this is actually the guy, Robbie, who is my, my show partner. He's actually up in Nova Scotia learning how to build canoes right now, which is kind of exciting. Um, but he's really an active gymnast, and he could do these backflips. So I had this, I really did this crazy manic cut-up of him backflipping. It was, it was great. And the last one is this kind of stony-looking hippie girl following his bubbles around the room. All right, I, I closed the video. Whoops, sorry, this is the wrong button. With these uh, um, kind of light, showy liquids, colored liquids spinning around in, in jars, kind of things. And that's what really made me start thinking about the, the psychedelic light shows. Um, you can kind of see they all blend together. They look a little bit like a Morris Lewis painting. The, the colors are kind of the exact opposite of what he does. There's um, almost no control you have over them once you put them in the dish. You can't tell what the the green and the blue are going to do together, or if they're going to turn to mud, or if they're going to be really uh, saturated and vibrant. Um, so after I made those, those videos, I asked my friend Robbie if he would like to, to make one of these classic psychedelic light shows, and we, we did. Um, we did it on July 4th of uh, 2005, and we did it at a, a gallery called Machine. We called the show the 4th of Doom, because we thought we could have this light show, we'd play all this Black Sabbath kind of doomy psychedelic metal, and it would uh, allow people to kind of be cured of their, their bad feelings uh, and have to achieve a sense of independence from what was happening in the country at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was the first light show. I had a little video of it, but it's not working, unfortunately. But uh, if you just kind of close your eyes and, and rub them, you get the sense of what the light shows are like. Um, so after I did that, I was, like I said earlier, I was a little... I really enjoyed the, how, um, how temporary and transitory it was, but I kind of wanted to have something that I could spend some time working on and making and it allowed me to think about the light shows a little bit more. Um, so through a variety of circumstances, uh, I turned to the latch hook rugs, and this is the first one I made. Um, it was inspired by another light show group called the Joshua Light Show up in San Francisco in the 60s. Um, this is also from the, the same series that was the very first rug you saw from the Fourth of Doom Light Show. This was in a, a county, the county fair in LA this past summer. They put a contemporary art show in the middle of this county fair. It was great. Uh, it's like two or 300,000 people got to see the show. I don't think any of them liked it, but um, it, it was fun nonetheless. There, these are much smaller than the ones that are over at the contemporary, but there's, there were seven of them, so they look a little bit like time-lapse photography. Um, I only put three of them here. But you can kind of see if you, if you if I blast through them real quick, kind of, whoa, look at the colors change and move. Kind of exciting, right? Um, sorry, I'm going a little bit fast. But. This is Robbie again. This is a, the second light show we ever did. It was at um, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. We did it out in the parking lot. And uh, we, at, at the museum there, we had a bunch of Scandinavian artists that were in town for another show and we just wanted to give them a little farewell, thank you for coming kind of event. And uh, so we did a light show. It was all L.A. theme music. You know, we had L.A. Woman and um, a Cheech and Chong song, uh, Born in East L.A., and some Guns N' Roses and Bob Seger. Um, so good kind of stuff. But Robbie was rollerblading the whole time because that was another, like, Los Angeles kind of Venice Beach thing you do. You rollerblade, and he made a Hollywood sign hat. So I'm back there projecting the lights on him, and he's dancing, kind of looking like a fool. Uh, I don't think the, the Scandinavians are really hard to read. I don't know if they like these or not. They just said, well, yes, yeah, very interesting. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like. You get a sense from here. This is actually the first image I'm showing of one of the light shows. In the background, how the blobby kind of colors move around and how they look projected. Um, back to Sun Ra. Uh, this is one of my contributions to the, the Sun Ra influence show. Same material, latch hook, but I made it into a pillow. It's his head. You know, I, I kind of thought it would be a nice kind of comforting figure. You can lean back on it and enjoy it. Uh, where are we at here? Oh, this is for yeah, another great show that I got to be in this past summer. Um, it, the summer's been great. I've been invited to be in four or five different group shows, that, and uh, they're all up right now, and it's been, it's been pretty fun. Um, yeah, what does it say? It says, counter-revolutionary honkies must see the light. It was for a political-themed show. Most of it was socially engaged art that's all kind of out in the public. Um, my stuff is pretty hermetic, and um, so when I was asked to be part of it, I was, didn't know quite what to make, so I kind of came up with a statement that I thought tied in the light shows, 
um, and uh, any kind of political statement. Ah. So the last piece that I've done, this is also another collaboration with my, my friend Robbie. Um, and too bad he couldn't be here. But uh, this is also for the Sun Ra show, but it really dovetails nicely with this Morris Lewis show. We had, uh, they offered it us to do this video wall, which is like this giant 50 foot facade outside of the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago. And so we made a, a video kind of based on this quote from a poem by Sun Ra that said, Every color, every different color is different as different things are different, which is kind of a great statement, but it, what does it mean? Kind of, kind of a little confusing. So we started thinking about what different colors meant, and we asked a series of performers to um, picture themselves as a color. We asked four different people. So we had blue, yellow, green, and red. And we uh, said, okay, you're red, so you have to decide how red would move. And we worked with them, and they came up with a little kind of dance of how they would move. And then we... Uh, we film them dancing, and then we ask them to, to mimic the other dances as well. So you have red being red and red being blue, et cetera. And it's great. I, have, I get to go see it in a couple of months, but it, it's like 12 or 15 feet high. I guess it's kind of monstrous. Um, so you kind of see when the person's red, um, and actually her sister is in the audience tonight, and it's great to have her here. This is my friend Liz. Um, they kind of fade into the background. You can't really see them so well. But uh, so I'll just blast through everybody's. Seeing that their colors. Um, that's Tom again. You might recognize him <laughs> a little bit. He's great. He's willing to do anything. Um, this is you can kind of see it in the facade here. And you can, yeah. Um, where am I with that statement? Um, so they just danced around to these colors, and we had off to the side the, the face of Sun Ra, and all the colors were rolling across his face. You can kind of see it up there. Is Mr. Sun Ra again? Uh, this is a great piece by an artist named Dave Muller. This is What Would Sun Ra Do? And it, he actually made bumper stickers of it as well, but that one is a big poster. I think. You can get to see the scale of it over there. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. That's where I'm at right now. I just finished up all those shows, and um, I'm kind of still dealing with the, the, the bit of the issues I raised while making them, kind of uh, what do you do with time and space and color, and how does uh, thinking so much about color affect your your daily life, what does observing light do, what's the, the point of trying to pay special attention to light. So if anybody has a good solution to it, uh, please let me know. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. Thanks. Thanks. Can, I, uh, can I ask Phil and Sarah to sort of continue the conversation. This is Phil Grauer and Sarah Brayman from New York. They're a collaborative team who are going to tell you a little bit about what they've been up to and their contribution to the show. show, Jeffrey. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to get this started, but oh. there we go. Um, we, we really just have images, sorry, we just have images from um, the one specific piece that relates to Stuart's show. Um, what, what they are, um, there are a series of photographs that Sarah and I worked on uh, uh, over the course of two winters. Um, and so these are uh, these are paintings that uh, Sarah performed, and um, on on snowbanks and and on the earlier photographs on on icicles. Uh, and I took the photographs. That's how the collaboration kind of works. Like M Morris Lewis, we didn't have a studio, so um, I guess our solution was we put the kids to bed and then. Um, Phil had been working on some photos that he'd done at night with a flash and, and was wanted to continue in that. So we did all these photos at night. So we just get a kit of, of gear and paint and dye together and the camera. And this is a, a shot in Western Massachusetts, by the way. It's not local. <laughs> um. We go out after dark and 
So this, this, these ones were done on the side of a road, so it was sort of, I don't know, just an old, a, a road that didn't have a whole lot of traffic at this time of night, but it was a little dodgy. You just throw the paint up and then hope that nobody stopped and yeah. tried to tell you not to do that. <laughs> so the flash, I mean, they're, they're, they're painted basically just by throwing, or we got like um, mustard bottles and filled them with dye. And so either squirting or throwing dye at the ice and it, you know, on the real cold nights it would freeze pretty fast. Um, and it, it, did, it did matter quite a bit what the weather was, you know, it's like if if it was cold, the dye would freeze quickly and there wouldn't be a whole lot of dripping on the warmer, soft, when everything's getting a little bit softer. Um, they wouldn't actually last as long and they would sort of melt off right before your eyes or sink into the snow. The, the, this is uh, also, as well as the, the, the dyes, we started to use fluorescent paint and uh, sp you know, spray paint. and. Uh, gold spray paint, black spray paint. They were pretty toxic <laughs> things. But we figured there were people doing worse things, so we went ahead with the project. This is the second uh, winter. The, the work could, could only exist for these kind of fleeting moments, and I like that about this project, because I'm I'm, I'm not uh, completely convinced about making permanent art things, objects, at least yet. Sarah, Sarah thinks differently and makes, is very, very confident in her studio practice and makes sculpture and painting. So she did the painting and, and I just sort of stood around with the camera hoping that um, the, the thing would look good according to her. Um, but. But inevitably, the, the ice would melt or the snow would melt and the work was gone, gone forever. So that there was this kind of urgency to take photographs, which I also liked. It, there was a necessity to take pictures of this work because it was going to be gone. And so it, uh, it answered a lot of problems for me. And that uh, it could only exist to, at a certain time of year. I mean, this, this, this body of work happened after a large snowfall and it's in a parking lot at a Walmart and uh, there's, they, they sort of push all the snow to one end of the parking lot and there's a huge pile. And we would climb into this pile and build these paintings, or Sarah would. Yeah, it was kind of like a crater because they, they push the snow and then they can't get it to the middle so they pile it up so it was handy because it was like a crater so we could get inside and once we were inside, you know, the mall security couldn't really see us very well. We were kind of hidden in there. We just kind of ducked when they would come by. But Yeah, and there was like several paintings within that kind of crater. And this would be one of them, and the last painting was another. And then this would be another. So, and, and, and it was this kind of show, you know, or gallery situation that reminded me a lot of the show upstairs. Yeah, we were standing in one here. of the large, you know, rooms, and it felt a lot like that standing yeah. in the middle, except for it was at it was at night, and it um, it was very it was it was it was actually quite a magical experience, I think, for both of us making these. Um, partly because of the physicality of the work, you know, it was just to have that scale. And uh, I really enjoy working big, and you know, I don't have a studio, so I, we do wind up trying to find other ways to get scale up um, and just to have the freedom to have a whole landscape to work with. And it was so secret because it was at night and, you know, you, people were c coming and going to the movies and no one really knew we were in there. Yeah, there's one, there's a, this, and I, I was shooting them specifically to keep the, the light stands out of the frame. Um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure why. I think it was probably to keep things clean and clear and to allow the flash to do the work of lighting the, the negative or the, or the 
the Chrome or whatever I was shooting on. And uh, the artificialness of the, the flash kind of is something that kind of uh, permits me to take photographs for some reason. And so that I was, you know, I would get low down in the, in the, in the frame to take pictures that, you know, wouldn't include the light stands. But this was the, this is one of the, the, you know, the, 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 rejects. the rejects. So you get a sense of what was going on. Dur during the day, it was, it was completely different and, and didn't have any uh, of this kind of glowy, magical quality so somehow. It, um, we would go back during the day, and it was, uh, it was just a fraction of the place that it would be at night. Um, I, don't, I don't know why. It was probably because the dyes got old very quickly, and they would sort of melt into the snow and, and kind of vanish quickly and fade fast. But I think there was something about the contrast between that, uh, the, the whiteness and, and the grayness of the dirty snows and the blackness of the roof, you know, night sky. Well, the, the photos are. If I was, um, they're they're that's about the height of a person. They're they're pretty they're pretty so large. There's a depth, so the yeah. top of that peak is probably like I don't know, 15 feet away from where the bottom of the frame is. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's confusing like that. The the scale of all of these photos, going back to even the icicle ones, are, are very hard to kind of capture, without any kind of reference. And that was part of the reason I think, um, you know, Phil had talked about editing out anything that was kind of real in the photos, like the lights, is just because then you're, the, the, looking at the image, it was so much um, more ungrounded. You didn't, it was, you know, people had a hard time getting a sense of like, what am I looking at? And that um, was something that we enjoyed working towards. But, but in the end, we were using like a, yeah, there was a, a, a kind of a pump thing that you used to spray uh, vegetation with. Pesticide to, spray, yeah. so we, that, that's where the last that one kind was of a big sweep. So sweep. The, the painting was getting quite big, you know, you could, with this sprayer on, on like a little, you know, you pump in a little bucket. And wand, wand kind of and thing. you could make, you know, paintings that were, you could make one gesture that was kind of, you know, 30 feet or... Yeah, this that's is the. Right? Yeah. That's it. That's the show. <laughs> sure. So, as you can see, when there's work out being done around the United States and elsewhere that has these curious ties to the legacy of more traditional painting, it gets very easy for me to sort of want to play with these folks um, and bring them here. And the other artists in this exhibition include Mitzi Peterson from San Francisco. For the, how many people in the room have actually seen the other exhibition? Anyone? <clears throat> it's very thoughtful and excellent. Um, so Mitzi Peter Peterson is a young artist from San Francisco, works with Xerox technology, drawings and Xerox and glitter. And Douglas Weathersby is a video artist from Boston who takes some very hypnotic videos, which also play with pigment and time uh, in very daily activities, home improvement activities. Um, I guess one of the things that I would want to uh, ask you guys, and I'm going to play the role of sort of a little, you know, uh, challenger, and then we can open the conversation up. Um, none of these folks were people who I knew had any interest in Morris Lewis at all. Okay, I only knew that in my mind the work has a connection to Lewis and his legacy. So I guess I would just ask as the first question is, when I called you and asked you, I'm mean, obviously choosing to participate, so this is not, you know, uh, uh, you know, odious to you, but what do you think the specific interests in mid-century painting and process are for you? And how do you use any of that in terms of the production of the work? Um, I, with that, for me, it started with 
uh, when I was at school, I had a, one professor named Lane Relier, and his big thing was kind of mid-century modernist painting, and he would just kind of drum it into our heads, and it's like, this is what was happening in the 60s, and it, after a while, it drove me crazy. It was like, what else is going on in the 60s? And that led me to look at a lot of the psychedelia kind of stuff. And whereas this painting, as I was telling Stuart earlier today, seemed like it was moving towards these moments of purity, how do you make a pure painting kind of serious thing? And the, the counterculture over on the West Coast was all, how do you make things not pure? How do you mess this stuff up? And um, it was nice when I finally got to looking at the light shows and researching who made them and stuff to realize that a lot of the guys were um, people who were interested in abstract painting and abstract expressionism and these color fields and stuff, but wanted to know how to make it to be about the gesture and that, that tiny moment rather than making a concrete object at the end. So, um, and I've just kind of gone the opposite way and made them into rugs. So that now I have these big objects again. Well, for, for, for me, um, I didn't have any, it, no influence at all. I mean, it, it was, they were never important. And uh, I went to a largely conceptual grounded college and uh, you were pretty much thrown out on the road for making a gestural work. Um, but I, coming, you know, to a, to a, to meet other artists in New York City that were influenced differently, I think that I w wanted to find a bridge to make these kinds of gestural works uh, that maybe hearken to the, the, these, you know, these color, color field painters, but, but I, I wasn't wanting to do it myself, you know, and, and Sarah, Sarah, Sarah was sort of the hired gun to, to do the performance work, and, uh, and her, her training is completely opposite to, to the, to the kind of schooling I got. So. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, certainly a lot of romance, probably similarly in school, um, towards that body of work, and I think, um, one of the things that I remember relating to when I was, I went to school in Baltimore, and they have a um, bunch of Morris Lewis paintings there, I don't know, a long time ago, but, um, I, I guess I really uh, related to the fact that the, you know, it wasn't, these paintings weren't about telling the story and they weren't even, you know, they weren't only about the paint, which, you know, kind of came first and like Pollock is so invested, like um, Jeffrey was talking about the vis viscosity of the paint and the, the physicality of the paint, but they, how it was described to me and it really rang true, is about an experience. You know, and I felt that experience of the making and just the experience of, of being in front of this work. And, um, you know, as corny as it is, that's something that I just can't really shake in my own practice is um, kind of a longing for an experience with art. And, um, you know, it comes often through physicality and certainly in this, this body of work, um, you know, the materiality was so present and, and you know, the experience that, that made the work was so strong and, you know, the hope is that that can, um, can happen in, in looking at the work. Yeah, there's some, I mean, there's something really fascinating about, I mean, Carl brings up this question of impurity and it came up in a conversation we had earlier with a group that was touring the exhibition. Um, this idea that you actually can make, I mean, what's interesting about all of the work in this show, I think, is that it all comes at the notion of making as a very hybrid activity. If you think about the work that, you know, all of you three are making, you know, Carl is making hooked rugs that sort of function like paintings, but they're based on photographs of light shows at rock and roll concerts, which reference psychedelia and drug culture. That's even hard to say, let alone think about. <laughs> But it's a hybrid notion. It's a thing which keeps flipping on itself and referencing other things. You know, your work is made already in a very soiled, I mean, this is not the purity of the wonderful snowstorm as it's happening. It's in the aftermath. So there's already a kind of dirty, grimy, kind of unseemly aspect to where it's happening in a parking lot at night. The flash is just as much a part of the palette as the uh, dye and, and spray. And so you're dealing with already a notion of purity and a, high, a kind of hybrid practice, which is much more a, a sensibility of the moment than it certainly was in the 50s, where the notion of a kind of pure activity was much more agreed upon. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about, because you came up earlier and a young woman who asked, asked Carl earlier, and I think it's worth repeating, about the influence of the feminine. Because of course the thing that Jeffrey mentioned, and I think it's relevant here, is that when Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan and his colleagues came to New York to look at the work that became influential on them, of course this was Mountains and Sea by Helen Frankenthaler, practically a large-scale watercolor. And that sort of quote-unquote sort of feminine gesture, the, the delicacy of it, the kind of looseness of it, um, I think is certainly in, you know, the hooked rug and the notion of woman's work and whatever sort of notion that may still exist there in terms of what's masculine and feminine in terms of materials. But it, does, does that notion, the kind of idea about who does what and gender play any kind of role in your practice as relevant to what we're talking about? that so, so much. I haven't really thought about gender in, uh, in, in what we do. Maybe you. Save us, Carl. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I didn't have a very good answer earlier oh, yeah. today when somebody asked, but they uh, basically it was like she thought that somebody who would make this work would have been a woman, and she was surprised, I guess, maybe pleasantly that I, that I had done it, but as a, or that I was not a woman or something. But uh, as a brief anecdote, my, my dad is here tonight, and my, um, I was a little bit kind of wondering what he would think seeing me making these big hooked rugs that are kind of girly kind of artworks, but my sister told me that when he had broken his leg a couple of years ago, he had been making a hooked rug as well, so it's a, <laughs> it's a family tradition. That's right. If your dad makes a hooked rug, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Uh, but basically the idea is that it comes from uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was a, kind of just trying to reclaim these ideas, these craft items as a, a serious art form, and uh, feminist artists were using them, and uh, most of you probably can explain them better than I can about, you know, just reclaiming them as valid activities and making them, people question why they were categorized as they were. And then in the 80s, all the guys wanted to get the picture, so like people like Mike Kelly or Paul McCarthy, uh, who were kind of some of my bigger influences, um, started making things too out of these women's work and it kind of lost any kind of sense of like who who could own what kind of materials at that point to make it feminist. Yeah, no, that may, I mean, I think that, I think the notion that these materials have unique histories that go across high and low traditions and male and female traditions, and, and, you know, and the thing is that both of these, uh, all of these artists and, and the others as well are dealing with a kind of hybrid practice and are slamming together various traditions that have not necessarily been put together before. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is, instead of me directing things, is ask folks in the audience who may have questions to address them to the artists, and, and I guess there is some logic to doing this on the microphone because we're, we're taping things. Um, so if you have questions about any of the things we've talked about, other concerns, uh, we're all happy to address them. All right, I don't know that I've ever used a microphone for questions, but here we go. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I, I just want to ask one for each body of work. Uh, for the, the rug work, I'm curious about the level of irony uh, in the work and to what extent it's ironic and to what extent it's actually a, a pure enthusiasm for the, for the colors and, and for the rug making. And just to go ahead and ask the other question, too, um, I think there are two different audiences for the, the icicle and snow work. One would be see seeing it in the, in the museum as a picture, and the other would be actually seeing the work as it was, uh, wherever it was made. And so I just am curious about your thoughts on that. Thanks. Um, how much of it is ironic? Well, because it, I, I do, I love making the light shows. I'm, I'm a little less enthusiastic for making the rugs, other than the fact that I love to see them done. Um, uh, I guess the, I wouldn't say that they're ironic. I, no, I, I do, the more I study about colors, because uh, it, it did get me to start looking at all these great color theory books and to look again at 
painters like Morris Lewis and people like that to, to reevaluate um, what, it, what it is that colors do to us and how it makes us think. I mean, most people know the kind of the example of like McDonald's and Burger King use red and yellow because those are supposed to make you feel hungry and like buying things. So it's just researching what these colors do. And I feel really at peace once, um, not so much when I make the light shows because I get really worked up about performing, but afterwards when I can watch the documentation, I, I love it. I feel the, I felt like it's really soothing and it has this really nice effect. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> just because of the humor with the performance pieces, for example, I mean, the, the context that you put put the rugs in, I, I saw, I definitely saw a humor to the people performing with the, the colors. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I'm not wrong about that. Oh, no, I, so. I think it's really funny. Um, yeah, I don't think all humor has to be, let's say, sarcastic or ironic. Um, it can be tongue-in-cheek, I guess. And, uh, maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I feel like that's a little bit different. You just have a sense of whimsy. Um, before before I uh, we got around to doing the snowbanks and ice school stuff, I, I had uh, taken pictures of uh, uh, graffiti uh, with a flash at night, found stuff on rock and cliff faces and, and stuff, and then also uh, uh, bird shit covered rocks too. Um, and uh, so there's. And, and, and I always had a problem with those things because they, they, uh, they sort of suffered. The photos didn't um, didn't do the either of those things just justice somehow. Um, and uh, and this 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 thing here with the with the melting snow and the kind of that the fleeting fle fleetingness of that moment of capturing Sarah's paintings as they kind of dissolve in, at night. Uh, kind of demanded the, uh, the documentation. The other works didn't didn't demand it as as as, as nearly as much. And so it was th th this this body was more satisfying to document wholly and fully and and you know use the kind of uh, the finished product of, of photo and uh, and mounting and uh, and all all framing and all the gallery junk that goes with the photo. It somehow. Fulfilled the, the that recipe because they were gone, literally within sometimes seconds of their execution, and that was satisfying. So it, it is exist. a conundrum. The the photo product is a real, you know, conundrum. But they didn't exist in any other form, really, besides the photo. I mean, you might see them on the side of the road, you might notice them during the day, but you you likely would probably just drive by. And the nature of this chasm or um, crater, you couldn't really see the snow paintings unless you were inside the crater, which I don't think many people. The, fla the flash picked things up that the eye couldn't, mm -hmm. and I, I used a camera that had auto auto focuses, and, and it was see seeing things that that we couldn't, and I, I like that about the artifice of that camera kind of coming folding back in on itself, and and this thing maybe only being able to exist for the camera seemed to allow uh, for the, the, you know, this finished procedure to sort of take place to, to, to the kind of end product of the, of the finished photo. I think it also would have made a great film, too. That being said, I don't, I don't think it needed still photos. It could have been a video kind of film. Other, other questions? Stuart, this is more a question for you. Um, in putting together this exhibition, did you have in mind trying to find our artists that were derivative of Morris Lewis, or did you happen to see this forming before the show? Or I mean, how'd you, how did you get this idea? <laughs> I come out of painting. I mean, just as a, as a trained sort of artist who started as a painter, and I'm sort of from a generation that's, you know, peered with with uh, Phil, uh, I come out of a, a deep interest in you know the legacy of how paintings get made. So I'm constantly sort of just tracking artists who are working in painting or in methods that seem engaged with painting. And I guess to some degree that the show comes only because the Morris Lewis show facilitated it as a, as a as a thing. It could have happened with a show of Paul Feely. It could have happened with uh, you know countless other painters whose works 
deal with the notion of a performative action in the studio, the, the notion of a kind of one-shot painting. You know, you look at those Morris Lewis's, those are, the painting is made in the moment. There's no correction, it's like done. And that way of working, the performative aspect, the speed of it, is interesting to me as a conceptual framework. So, I, you know, I've been loosely following these various artists. So it's not like, oh my God, I've got to scramble and put together a Morris Lewis related show. These were people who I've been interested in for a while. The Morris Lewis show was the excuse to bring them together. Um, but I do think that what's, what's interesting about the, the fact that the Morris Lewis show is up now and the fact that this work, whether these artists are directly interested in Lewis or not, is that the, the play between the past and the present is always really interesting. We always think about it as, you know, the past is informing what artists are doing now. And I would argue that in this case, you know, the fact that there are artists, these are very three very good examples of people who are playing in this terrain of the making of pictures, whether they're actually paintings or not, starts to tell us how to relook at Morris Lewis. I mean, what was interesting and, and, and why Jeffrey was very eager for the show to be done and done simultaneously and us to collaborate on a night like this was that this show hopefully gives people a way to relook at the Morris Lewis. And that dialogue back and forth and what is scale and what is permanence and what is pure and all of those things are really fascinating. So it, it really was a sort of excuse. It also was a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with the high as an institutional thing. The contemporary has long wanted to do that. We haven't had a chance to or the right moment hadn't arrived, this was it. So, you know, it, it just had so many things built in that were potentially win-win situations that that's how it came about. The other thing I would just point out, we have, you know, Scott Ingram is here, right? And there are other artists in the room whose works are very engaged in this legacy. And I had several people say to me, you know, we know Scott Ingram whose works, you know, like have a very direct relationship to Lewis in a bunch of ways although are equally irreverent and could have easily been in a show like this, I can't tell you how many people said to me, why isn't Scott in it? And one of the first things I did was call several artists who would have likely been in it and said, you're not gonna be in it because you make paintings and drawings and I want video and sculpture and, and, and other things. The other thing is, I, which I don't know is how many folks know, but the show over at the Contemporary is titled Lewis Morris. And the pleasure of that was actually trying, to, we had people call us and say, you know, we really feel bad for you, you made a mistake. It's, you know, it's, it's Lewis, it's Morris Lewis. And, and you know, we I titled it that way because I wanted somehow the title to be kind of stuck in somebody's mind or throat, like, wait, it's, it could be a person, but it also could be a mistake. It could be conscious or, or erroneous, but it could signal that something is wrong. And that was my hope, was that the title Lewis Morris would signal that something was wrong in this relationship to Lewis Morris. And Mar Morris, see, I can't even remember what it is. Um, and, and the fact that it has been, it has functioned that way, I think has been a nice little added thing. Um, other, other questions for anybody? We probably have room for one or two more questions, and that would be it. I have a question for you, for you guys. I didn't, did, you, did you think of when you were making the, Things. Was it kind of like the Jackson Pollock moment where it was the actual making kind of thing was the art? Or, and then the photograph is the document of the art, or is the photograph supposed to be the, the, the end kind of thing? Or is it two things? They were set up for, for, for the photos. Did you, when you were making it, did you feel like any kind of uh, performative? Or was it just like we have to get this done so we can take the, the picture? And it's cold and it's dark. Well, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was like, really yeah. fun. I mean, it was mostly like, it was, it was a blast, and it was a, it was a fantasy, you know, because you're in this fantasy landscape, and you, you've got all this dye, and you can rid this huge vast of white and gray and black, and you can do whatever you want. But, but basically, I, I, you know, I was the hired gun in this situation for Phil to take these night photos that had come from another line of work, you know, that, that had come before. So Sarah, Sarah has a, 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 a very, and I should have shown some pictures of them, but they're, they're abstract sculptures and paintings, and so she professes to know when and to end these things and how to make them. 
and so I, you know, That's gave her the license to, you know, do the, do this, you know, do the area until she felt like it was worth taking a picture of, you know, the, so that kind of. Paint, like paintings she, too goofy for Phil's. Like, well, it was just like I'm, I'm not so sure. Around, you know? I'm not so sure how I would end it or when it would start or where it would mark. You know, should I use yellow or green or red or black or oh god? You know, like it just would have. But Sarah has a practice where that gets examined, quite like the guy upstairs. There's a, a daily ritual of color, you know, and uh, execution uh, of color on 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 objects. There's a so. Uh, I, I was trusting that this, you know, site work could kind of translate into finished areas in the landscape that were kind of suitable for a photographic event. But, you know, that's kind of it. I mean, whether I got the best angles, I don't really know. Carl, you know, Carl mentioned uh, Jackson Pollock, and I would, I would raise this for people in the audience. There's a great text. It's written by Alan Caprow in the mid-50s. It's called The Legacy of Jackson Pollock, and it was, it was a very prescient piece of writing. It actually was, a, you know, somewhat of a manifesto for where Caprow, and we know Alan Caprow as the sort of, you know, originator of happenings, and he uses Pollock in a very interesting way to set up the idea of where certain kinds of performative works will come in the future, where, the, where they will derive from. And he sets up, the, he sets up using Pollock as a kind of you know, once the notion of the painting is performed, there's the paint that falls on the canvas and there's the paint that falls on the floor. And from the physical fact of what's what, the paint on the canvas is the painting. The paint on the floor is, you know, the residue of this activity. And he then talks about the artist of the future using not just paint but aluminum foil and string and other kinds of active food, anything that one could sort of work with in the expanded field. And I think these are, you know, really good examples of artists who work using that idea of the process can extend out of the studio, out of the house. Um, it can be collaborative. You know, we certainly don't think of much of the legacy of certainly mid-century and abstract painting as being a collaborative practice. So uh, if you don't know this text and come upon it, I think it'll be uh, interesting for folks who, who may... Uh, find that the germs of some of these artists and their activities uh, come purely out of a text that they may not have read and may not know about, but in the mid-50s, you know, Capra was already sort of hip to where some of this idea of performance painting was going, and it certainly, I think, arrives in, in, in their work. Um, if there are no final thoughts, I would, anybody? Oh, okay. So what are your next projects that you have coming up? Are you planning on staying within this style, or do you feel like you want to move on to something, well, something global, new? Global warming has put us up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I make, I'm continuing with the latch hook kind of stuff. I'm making more pillows that are, I'm trying to make an environment of the latch hook kind of things, and also incorporate the posters. So yeah, just more of the same mess, I guess. Yeah, we we both continue to make, um, you know, other work. A, 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 a large body of both of our work is outside of what we showed tonight, so there's still kind of a lot of other things going on outside of this. Um, I don't know if it uh, we get some snow this year, we'll definitely go out. Sarah has a very active sculpture. I feel more like a snowboarder. <laughs> this isn't really a question, but it's just sort of a comment. Um, as I was sitting here listening to you talk, uh, particularly about Sun Ra, in the 80s, I was remembering uh, he used to come to Atlanta and perform just a few blocks from here, so his memory is here. Yeah, um, well, he's just fantastic. If you ever have a chance to, the music is, is great, but if you have a good chance to see a DVD of, the, of him and his orchestra performing, it's Amazing, and they're still going around. They're they're led by uh, like the saxophonist Marshall Allen, and they're they're great. They're like seventy and eighty year old guys. And the last time I saw them was just a, a few weeks ago. One of them was doing backflips on stage, and it's a really hypnotic and terrifying at the same time because like, this could be the last moment you ever get to see some of these guys. But they're just they're going nuts up there. They have more energy and more life in them than 
a lot of people I've seen. But yeah. I, I would suggest we leave, end our evening on the energy of Sun Ra. And uh, I would just urge you in, in, in both ways to take a more thoughtful, non-speedy view through the Morris Lewis show, certainly. Uh, and when you can, before the ninth, hopefully come and see the work of these artists as well as the other things up at the Contemporary. I, uh, I'm really thrilled that we were able to collaborate with our colleagues at the High and have to thank certainly Jeffrey and Virginia Shear in the Education Department and Stacy and other folks who have been like really generous to us. So I want to thank them. I want to thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at other events and um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, that was a nice piece of